Dear people of God, today we conclude that series between resurrection and ascension. Listening to Acts 1, 1 to 11 this morning, we have to realize the shock of the ascension. Now, that period between Easter and ascension must have been deeply confusing for the disciples. Good Friday, the death of Jesus. Easter, the bewildering but delightful resurrection of the Lord and Savior. And then following that, the unexpected appearances. Living in that 40 days in which you'd have to ask the question, was Jesus really here or not? One moment the disciples felt all alone. The next thing they knew, there was Jesus. He would teach them, counsel, instruct. And suddenly, as mysteriously as he came, he disappeared. Jesus was with them, but in a bewildering and confusing way. And he had made predictions. Predictions about leaving and then coming again. Predictions about sending the Holy Spirit. And it must have been a bewildering time for them to try to figure out, and now what were they to do as the followers of Jesus Christ, the one who had set their path with him, those who sat at his feet, those who learned from the rabbi and were instructed to carry out the ministry of Jesus. Their life had become unpredictable, confusing. And what were they to make of this situation? And in the midst of that, in the midst of all of the bewilderment about the appearances and disappearances of Jesus is the shock of the ascension. We're going to consider some of the implications of the biblical story about the ascension of Jesus and then also apply that to our lives because you and I also live in times of unpredictability, at times confusing circumstances, bewildering situations, and how are we to set our path as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ in the midst of uncertainty in life? The ascension of Jesus must have made a powerful, lasting impression. The final thing that you see is, is imprinted on your memory, and some of you who are among the more elderly probably remember immigrating for those of you who are immigrants. I've heard this said by many people. Even though they were in their teenage years, when it came time to say goodbye and to immigrate to Canada, some of you have described what it was like to stand on the boat and then the boat would start to move away from shore and, and you would wave to loved ones. And you would wonder, will we ever see each other again? Nobody was predicting at that time how easy it would be just a decade or two later to get on an airplane and fly across the ocean. But at that time, that, that waving goodbye, the final impression was etched on the memory and Family member said, we'll never forget that day, waving goodbye and wondering, would we see each other again? Now, Jesus is on his way to heaven. Jesus has completed his earthly ministry. He has promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, and now he's about to go. And what a shock it must have been for the disciples. Jesus came and went, but now suddenly he's rising on a cloud. And there's this sense of finality. This is different from anything that they had ever experienced. Yes, Jesus surprised them in times before, but, but now there's a sense of definity to this, a sense of this is the conclusion, this is closure. As Jesus leaves 
What a shock there must have been. And, and that shock also prepares them to hear a message. There's a value to that shock of Jesus disappearing. There's a, a lesson in it to be learned by the disciples and by us as the followers of Jesus Christ. First of all, it's a powerful testimony to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He had demonstrated his power in so many ways. When there were sick, Jesus healed them. When there were people that were dead, Jesus even raised them from the dead, the cripples, the blind. Each time demonstrating the kingdom of God had come with power, and Jesus was truly the Messiah. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is described in Ephesians chapter 1 as the most powerful testimony and the most powerful proof to the power of God Almighty, the Creator, who actually raises Jesus from the dead. And so miracles were not unusual in the life of the disciples and the followers, but this one. Think of the amazing circumstance and situation that Jesus would be taken up on the clouds and that he would go and, and they would all together watch that miraculous ascent of Jesus. It was a powerful testimony to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. There were other religions, and some of that went back, well, they went back for ages. In the time of the Old Testament, it was believed that some of the gods were the cloud riders. We've all heard of the god Baal. And in the language of the worship of Baal, Baal was the cloud riding god. Jesus Christ in his death and his resurrection has demonstrated that he has power over all powers in creation, powers in heaven and on earth. It's demonstrated that Jesus is the one true Son of God. And as he says in John 14, no one comes to the Father except through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so they see the way to the Father. They say, see Jesus, the supreme, uh, the, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, riding the cloud as a visible, miraculous demonstration of the power of God. Shock value in that. Jesus is Lord over all the powers. This is also an emphatic ending to the chapters of Jesus' earthly ministry. It is, in a sense, the dramatic reversal of Christmas. This is, in a sense, Christmas Day backwards. On that Christmas Day, Jesus came from the glory of heaven down to earth, and he took on his human form, and he walked and taught and, and led his people on earth in the different stages of his ministry. And now this seems, in a sense, like Christmas undone. Emmanuel, the one who was God with us, the one who left the glory of heaven and came to earth, now is reversing that and going from earth to heaven. There's a shock in seeing Emmanuel depart. It's a wake-up call to Christ's ongoing mission. As the disciples stand there and they gaze up and, and with their eyes they try to hold on to their Savior. As their feet are on the ground but their mind and their thoughts go with the Savior and ascend with him, two angels appear to them and call them back to earth. A wake-up call. What are you doing looking up into heaven? Don't you realize that your place is here on earth? What are you focusing on? Do you realize that you have a task, you have a mission? From time to time, we in the church all need to be reminded of that wake-up call and hear that reminder Oh yes, it's fine that our thoughts regularly go to heaven. 
And it's fine that we spend time in devotion and that we pray to our God and that we have a union with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we experience that in our devotions. That's an important part of staying connected with God and staying connected with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But then we also need to hear the voice that says, you can't just look up to heaven. We need to look around. What's God calling us to do? What's our task? What's our mandate? As long as our feet are on this ground, what are we called to do as the body of Jesus Christ and the followers of our Savior? And we're not to allow the bewilderment and the confusion of circumstances in life to derail us from the calling that God has given to us as the followers of Jesus Christ to represent the kingdom, the mission, and the goal of Jesus in this world today in practical, real, down-to-earth living for Jesus Christ. The disciples were called to continue the mission. They were called to wait until the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then the word was to go out from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. They were being called to continue Christ's ministry on earth. Jesus had completed his part of it. He had taught. He had put into place the skeleton, the framework for his church on earth. He had empowered his disciples. He had paid the price, the incredible price for all unfaithfulness, for all of the sins of the world so that his followers could be set free. Jesus had, in every respect, laid the foundation, set the foundation for the building of his church and kingdom on earth. And he leaves with the promise of the sending of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will put flesh on the skeleton. The Holy Spirit will come into the church and and will breathe the life of the resurrection, the life of newness into these people in order to be the body of Christ on earth. And so the disciples are told, wait, wait and pray and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they will be set free with the most glorious gospel message that the world has ever heard. And and then it's sort of like Christmas all over again. Good news of great joy. Emmanuel, God with us. Not just Jesus born as a baby, but Emmanuel, God with us. The Holy Spirit poured out on the church so that we know that we are not alone. We are led by the Holy Spirit and in the power of the Holy Spirit, lives will be changed. There had been an installment of that newness of life through the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. The blind and able to see, the lame to walk, the broken hearts that were healed. And that was just the first installment when the Holy Spirit comes on the church. Once again, there's a reminder of new life and we don't need to live in the brokenness of the past and we don't need to be crippled by our sin. Jesus' ministry as administered through the Holy Spirit truly sets people free. Wounded hearts are healed. The lonely are comforted. The grieving feel the arm of the Savior. God loves his children. And the disciples are not to be left in their confusion and their bewilderment, grieving the loss of their Savior, but they are to to look out at the world and recognize, as Jesus has said, that the harvest is ripe. It's time to gather the church. 
people of God, the promised coming of the Holy Spirit was not just for the disciples, but it's for all of us. And we have an inclusion in Christ's mission on earth. And Ascension and Pentecost, which is, is coming up and we'll celebrate that next week, Ascension and Pentecost should be a riveting reminder for all of us. We're not alone. Emmanuel, God is with us. The Holy Spirit is poured out for precisely this purpose, to strengthen the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ on earth. And so we may celebrate the ascension of Christ, not in bewilderment, but in a sense of delight that Jesus completed his part of his ministry on earth and entitles us to continue it. And we do that celebrating familiarity amidst uncertainty. Note what the disciples are told. This same Jesus will come back in the same way. What a glorious promise. This same Jesus will come back in the same way. Oh, there are going to be a a whole lot of question marks for the disciples. They're going to undergo persecution and trial. They will face hardship and hatred. There will be tremendous joys as people turn their lives to Jesus Christ and as they're transformed by the power of the gospel. And there will be times of absolute bewilderment. Where now? What do we do? How do we go forward? And then there's always that lasting impression of the farewell with Jesus and the reminder, this same Jesus will come back in the same way. He will come back visibly. He will come back publicly in a demonstration of his power and of his glory. And the disciples would live between those two bookends, the ascension and the return of Christ. And we're in that time period and we're in that category as well. And so people of God, let's take comfort from it. Let's take purpose and direction and allow our mission to be established by that reality. Jesus has gone to heaven. Yes, there are questions in our lives. There's the unpredicted and the unexpected. But we know that this same Savior will come again. Are we ready? Are we ready that if Jesus comes today or tomorrow, if Jesus comes again soon, as God's word says, are we ready to greet him? And are we committed? That in the meantime, as long as Jesus tarries, we won't just spend our time idly looking into space. But we'll look around and we'll say, our feet are planted on this ground. We're here for a purpose. We're here with a mission. We are here to build the church of Jesus Christ. We are here to defend justice to help the homeless, to comfort the brokenhearted, to be the real presence of Jesus in this world. And we're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit to help us to carry out that mission. So we can set aside the confusion. We can set aside the hurts of the past. We can set aside those things that we would think would disqualify us from being followers of Jesus Christ and say we have a glorious focus and a glorious mission. And Ascension Day to Pentecost is a marvelous time to remind us of the renewal that we have in our lives to recommit ourselves to that mission that Jesus gave to his church as he ascended into heaven. Let's sing about that, shall we? Let's re-